And um, you know the song that we sang just now, Lion and the Lamb, really has very meaningful and biblical lyrics that vividly portrays to us the uniqueness of our Lord that is described in these two metaphors, the lion and the lamb. I think we have sung this song many times in our worship services, but I have never really paid attention to the lyrics. I guess, you know, most of the time you get caught by the catchy rhythm and the rhyming words and this, and this is what got stuck in my head. You know, I can't remember all the lyrics, but the words that keep coming is every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, and not who can stop the Lord Almighty. I think the problem with this song is that you sing it once in church, it keeps playing your head again and again, and it comes out at the most unexpected moments, like when you're doing your washing or when you're ironing. I'm not sure whether it happens to you, but it happens to me. And during one of the more recent worship services where we sang this song at CCC, uh, something out of the norm happened. And then when we came to the part where we sang um, Every Knee Will Bow before the Lion and the Lamb, and it was like just out of the blue, there was a voice in my head that spoke loud and clear. Do you really know what you're singing? And I believe it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. I started to pay attention to the lyrics. And then the next question that followed was, do I really believe what I'm singing? And um, the next thing I knew, right at the very spot itself, strangely, I said to myself, this will be my sermon title for the next message. And so today, I'm, I'm preaching on the lion and the lamb. And I went back and looked up the many scripture verses on the lion and the lamb and read up as much as I could about lions and lambs. And my understanding was really much enlightened through the research and um, the study of the scriptures. And once again, it just caused me to gaze upon the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and to appreciate the richness of the two diverse qualities that is encapsulated in these two metaphors, the lamb and the, the lion and the lamb. And my eyes were open to see that, you know, to see his splendor and glory. A glory that is mingled with humility. There is no earthly power, right, that can compare with his dominion and might. And yet, that sovereign power is clothed with a spirit of obedience and submission, even to death on a cross. And as I was giving thought to this, it reminded me of a movie that I saw some years back, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. How many of you have seen that movie? Oh, not many. Or perhaps you may have read The Chronicles of Narnia. Well, this is the second novel in a series of seven children fantasy novels, The Chronicles of Narnia, that was written by C.S. Lewis. And this series has many Christian themes, and it was designed as such that the first book, The Magician's Nephew, would tell about creation and how evil entered the land of Narnia. And the second novel, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, had to do with the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Well, we'll watch a four-minute clip from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, where you will see Aslan, the talking lion, how he dies at the hands of the white witch. Well, as you can see, C.S. Lewis presents a very biblical portrait of Christ in the character of Aslan. Aslan is the Turkish translation for lion. And um, C.S. Lewis was saying that he used the imagery of lion to portray Christ because at one point of time, he was strangely dreaming about lions many times. And, uh, and besides, Christ is often referred to as the Lion of Judah in the Bible. So in the particular segment of the movie that we watched just now, we saw how Aslan, the king of the beasts, the rightful king of Narnia, 
He went through great humiliation in sacrificing himself to save a traitor. And as you watch the movie just now, you saw the willing submission of Aslan in, as he walked up to the stone table to die. And yet, as you look at him, there was a certain sense of dignity and a sense of majesty amidst all the cheers and humiliation. He could have fought back, isn't it? But he didn't. And if he were to roar loudly enough, I think it would have sent all his enemies fleeing. But like a lamb that is led to slaughter, just as the scripture says, and like the sheep that is silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. And on his own accord, he offered himself in the place of the condemned, and he died. But I, of course, we know the end of the story. But he rose again, and he destroyed the power of evil. And he breathed life into his warriors, and they began to wage war against the white witch and her, scheme, and her armies. And you know the end of the story, that eventually Aslan, the majestic lion, won, bringing in a creator world. I think the spiritual parallel between uh, that Aslan has to Christ is very evident and there's really no need for further explanation. If you look at the term the Lion of Judah, you will find that it is used to refer to Christ only once in the book of Revelation and that is found in chapters 5 verse 5. But when you look at the term the Lamb, you would see that it actually occurs about 28 times in just the book of Revelation itself. And we all know that in other parts of the Bible, besides Revelation, Jesus has been referred to as the Lamb of God, as we shall see later. Now, when we look at these two creatures, we all know that the Lion and the Lamb both have very diverse, they are very diverse creatures with characteristics that is almost the experience extreme opposite of each other. A lion is strong, a lamb is weak. A lion is dangerous, a lamb is gentle and harmless. A lion preys on the animals, but the lamb is the one that usually gets preyed upon. So, how can Jesus be the lion and the lamb at the same time? So, what we will do is this. We will, in the next few minutes, we will attempt, first of all, to look at the lion of Judah. Then, we will look at the Lamb of God as revealed in scriptures. And then we will look at the passage in Revelation chapter 5 that talks about the lion and the lamb. And we will see how both these two diverse characteristics are wonderfully met in Christ. And that, make, and that is what makes him so unique and without comparison. The Lion of Judah. The reference to Jesus as the Lion of Judah is an allusion to a messianic promise that was given through Jacob's prophecy over his son Judah, and that goes back all that goes all the way back to Genesis. Before he died, right, we know that Jacob actually blessed each one of his twelve sons, and this is what Jacob prophesied over his fourth son Judah, whom he had with his wife. First wife, Leah. Let's look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 8 to 10. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's club. Cup. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who, dare, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. The scepter is a symbol of lordship and power. The kingly tribe would descend from the tribe of Judah. The lion, that is the king of the beasts, is a symbol of royalty, royalty and power, and he became the emblem of the tribe of Judah. Now, up until this point, right, we all know that of all the sons of Jacob, Joseph had been the one who had been associated with royalty. 
But from this point on, the focus was moved to Judah, the tribe of Judah. And his father told him that with the blessing given to him, his brothers would now bow down before him and nations will pay tribute to him. And this was, of course, a prediction that the, the future ruler of Israel and of the earth would actually come out of the tribe of Judah, that is the royal tribe. The prophecy was fulfilled when we see years later, David who came from the tribe of Judah, he succeeded the throne. And it was from the line or the root of David that Jesus, the Messiah, would ultimately come. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 10, Jesus is, is described as the root of David. And we see that the imagery of kingship here is further enhanced with the establishment of the lasting kingdom of Jesus Christ, the root of David, that will extend throughout all the world to all nations. So when Jesus is referred to as the Lion of Judah, it is really a statement of his deity. When we look at the Old Testament, you will find that God is sometimes portrayed as having the characteristics of a lion. And God is seen as a lion who protects and fights on behalf of his people. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 31, verse 4 to 5. It says, This is what the Lord says to me. As a lion growls or roars, a great lion over its prey, and though a whole land, a whole band of shepherds is called together against it, it is not frightened by their shouts or disturbed by their clamor. So the Lord Almighty will come down to do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and will rescue it. Here, the symbol of lion is not one of destruction, but of protection. And here, Isaiah is telling us, as the king of beasts stands proudly over the prey, which he has made his own against the shepherds who try to rob him of his prize, so will Jehovah, the Lord of the hosts, refuse to surrender Jerusalem, his prized possession, to Israel's enemy. And here it is an imagery of how God acts as the protector of his people. He fights on our behalf. And uh, if you look at lions, right, just as a male lion protects the pride, pride a pride can consist of about maybe a few male lions and uh, around a dozen females together with the young. So a pride can be up to 40 lions. So it's the male lion that protects its pride from harm and danger. And so in that same way, the lion of Judah protects its own. And the lion is able to keep its pride from danger because simply because it is one of the most agile animal of brute strength. You know, a typical weight of a male, a mature male lion is about 400 to 500 pounds and it can kill an animal up to 1,000 pounds. You can imagine the might of a lion. And a lion is so powerful that it can actually take down water buffaloes, even elephants and crocodiles. And among all the cats, the big cats, like the jaguars, the panthers and the tigers, right? It is the lion that has the loudest roar. And do you know this? That a lion's roar is about 114 to 144 decibels. You may ask, what is, what is this equivalent to? This is about 25 times the sound of a closed gas-powered lawnmower or a jack engine, and that can be heard up to five miles. So can, you can imagine how loud uh, uh, the roar of a lion is. Just now, Aslan didn't roar very loud. <laughs> but if you roared loudly enough, I think it is enough to send all of them flying. So, why does a lion roar? A lion roars to make all the prey scatter from their hiding places. And so that once exposed, they become easy targets. And the male lion actually stuns its prey with its roar. And that is why it is no wonder that the Bible sometimes likens the voice of the Lord to the roar of a lion. So we can see that a lion is strong in power. 
but the Lion of Judah is omnipotent in his power. And so today, if you are gripped by some kind of fears or intimidation, know that the Lion of Judah is more than enough to fight for you because you belong to him. And then there's another, yet another very peculiar verse in Hosea that pictures God as a lion to his people, chastening them until they repent and return to him. Hosea chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I will tear them to pieces and go away. I will carry them off with no one to rescue them. Then I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. This is not a very comfortable verse, but it actually demonstrates the grace of God that is extended to his people, especially those who are obedient to him. And we see in the entire history of Israel, we see the many judgments of God upon his stubborn, stiff-necked people. And really, these judgments were actually acts of mercy to prevent them from a greater judgment and destruction that would come if they would continue to sin and go their own way. And you know, if God had not given them after war warning after warning, they would think that they are safe and they are okay. But because of their afflictions and hardships, it jolted them back to the reality that they had gone so far away from God and that it was time to return to Him. So today, if you feel like you're hedged in from all sides and you seem to be getting into one trouble after another, one struggle after another, and you know deep in your heart something is not right in your relationship with God, will you pause for a moment and ask yourself, what is God trying to tell me through all these different afflictions that I am going through? Okay, let's move on. When, you, when we look into the New Testament now, there is not much of a mention about lion, except in the book of Revelation. And the term, the Lion of Judah, is mentioned actually only once, and that is in Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, which we will be reading afterwards, the conquering Lion of Judah alone has the authority to open the scroll containing God's eternal purpose. We shall talk about this further when we come to the Lion and the Lamb passage. But for now, we would like to look at the term, the Lamb of God. We all understand that in the, New Testament, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice of lambs played a very important role in the Jewish religious life and their sacrificial system. And the sacrifice of a lamb without blemish and defect was an important sacrifice for the yearly Passover feast. And uh, the Passover feast was celebrated in remembrance of how God delivered his people from bondage in Egypt and the first Passover lamb was offered on the night of the, their exodus from Egypt. And the blood of that sacrifice that was sprinkled on the doorposts of the Israelites actually was to be a sign to the angel of death who was passing by to slay the firstborn of every Egyptian right, that night. And when the, when the angel of death saw the blood on the doorposts, he would pass by the houses and the Israelites would be saved. So, the Old Testament Passover lamb was really a foreshadow of the better and final Passover lamb, that is, Jesus Christ. And we see that the slaying of the Passover lamb and the applying of the blood to the doorposts of the houses is really a picture of Christ's atoning work on the cross. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12 to 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts. And on the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. In the New Testament now, we see Jesus being referred to as the Lamb of God. He's the perfect and ultimate sacrifice for our sins. 
John the Baptist recognized Jesus as the Lamb of God. We read in John chapter 1, verse 29, when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then we see how the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, links the Lamb without defect to Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, he says, For you know, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And in the book of Revelation chapter 5, we see that it was the lamb that was slain that took the scroll that only the Lion of Judah had the authority to open. This is the only passage in the New Testament where the Lion and the Lamb is mentioned together. And we, allow, and we would like to read right now Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 to 10. Verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seals. Verse 6, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. Now as the story unfolds in Revelation chapter 5, we see the, that the scroll contains a record of the future decrees and the purposes of God. It tells us what's going to happen, what is going to take place, and how history is going to be consummated. And the scroll contains the unveiling mystery, the unveiling of the mystery of God that the Old Testament prophets had foretold, and of how God's judgment and His kingdom would come. But for now, these plans have been sealed in that scroll, and the seal, and the scroll is sealed. And so, who could? break open the seal and open the scroll. Who is worthy to do so? We are told as we read, as we read Revelation chapter 5, John looks around and he, and he sees no one who has the ability or authority to open the scroll. John is distressed and he, he weeps. And while he is weeping, one of the elders came up, comes up to him and says, Weep no more, because there is one who is worthy to open the scroll, and that is the Lion of Judah. He has conquered, and he is able to open the scroll. And so John looks around expecting to see a lion, but there is no lion to be seen. And instead, what did he, what, what, what did he see? Instead, he sees a lamb standing at the center of the throne, looking as though it had been slain. And the lamb proceeds to take the scroll from the right, him, right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down and worship the slain lamb, who is Christ himself. 
which verse 9 tells us. He was once slain, but now he stands as the reigning one. The lamb speaks of his meekness. The lion speaks of his majesty. As the lamb, he is judged for the sins of the world. But as the lion, he is the judge who will mete out God's justice and destroy all evil. The lamb speaks of the grace of God. The lion speaks of the government of God. The lamb character refers to his first coming. The lion character refers to his second coming. As the lamb, he is the saviour of the world. As the lion, he is the soaring, soon coming king. So the conquering lion of Judah is the lamb that was slain. It is the same person. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the lion has triumphed because he has laid down his life as a slain lamb. And the lion's victory was accomplished by his death as a lamb. He has conquered by his suffering. Jesus, the lamb that was slain, will soon return as the victorious Lion of Judah, the coming judge and king. And here's the good news. Because we have put our faith in Christ, we share in his victory. His victory is ours. We triumph in, we triumph in him and through him. It's not by our might, not by our power, but by his spirit. And the power of his spirit, his spirit, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And the power of the Holy Spirit is the power of the Lion of Judah. And so as we look at this glorious passage that talks about the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ, so how should we live in the light of this glorious hope? I think first and foremost, we need to remember how Jesus triumphed. He triumphed by laying down his life as a slain lamb. And it is a reminder to us that we conquer and triumph by being willing to take up our cross to follow him, the slain lamb. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses, isn't it? And it is interesting to note that the word that is used for witness here is the Greek word martyrs which is the word from which we get the English word martyr. One who bears witness by his death. Well, I guess in our case, it may not be so much of a case of martyrdom as in it is a case of death to ourselves. I think all of us as believers, we all desire to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, isn't it? I think we all want to do great things for God. We want, you don't want to go through our lives mourning and groaning because of life's hardships and afflictions. And none of us want to live a life of defeat, isn't it? But you know, if we are really to ex experience the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to empty ourselves. Self must be dethroned and Christ enthroned. God cannot and He will not empower, He will not entrust us with the power of His Spirit the same power that is manifested in the Lion of Judah, if we are not living a life of obedience and submission of the slain lamb. Because you know why? We can abuse that power to our own detriment or to the destruction of others. And God is looking for people who are humble enough to be exalted by Him and who He can fill them with the fullness of His power. You know, if we are not seeing the power of the Holy Spirit, being demonstrated in our lives the way we ought to, could it be because we have not truly laid down our lives like the slain lamb? Many times we want the power of God to be demonstrated in our whatever difficulties or challenges that we are facing. But if we search ourselves, ourselves honestly, you will find that many times we are, we are the ones who is telling God what He should do in our prayers. We are not allowing Him 
to have his way. But we are wanting our own way. Even though we may be praying, but at the end of the day, self is really reigning on the throne rather than Jesus himself. And so today is a reminder to us, if we really want to, to see the fullness of the Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit being demonstrated in our lives, which I, I believe all of us as Christians would want to see the demonstration of God's power in our lives, then we have to lay down, we have to be prepared to lay down our lives like the slain lamb. A life of obedience and submission. And we will see a fuller measure of the power of the line of Judah being demonstrated in us and through us. The song that we sang just now reminds us that our God is the Lion of Judah. He is roaring in power and fighting our battles. We do not need to be afraid. The Lord has given us His assurance in Isaiah 43 verse 2. It's not on the screen, but I read to you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, In this world, you will have many tribulations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The Lion of Judah has conquered. He has triumphed. And He can enable us, and He will enable us, to be more than conquerors in Christ if we would allow Him to. We can live as His anointed witnesses, boldly proclaiming His word. We don't have to be afraid when we share the gospel or teach the truth of God. We don't have to dilute the gospel or his, the hard teachings of God so that it will sound pleasing or rather it, will, it wouldn't sound offensive to our hearers. We don't have to plead with people to believe in Jesus. We don't have to cover up by telling them that we are inviting them to a musical presentation when it's really an evangelistic meeting. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As you go and share the gospel, with your unsafe loved ones and friends. Know that the Lamb of God has gone before you to offer grace, the salvation grace of God to them. And you can be sure that the Lion of Judah will be there to destroy all the works of the enemy in the lives of your loved ones and friends. Because Jesus said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it was for this purpose that the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Our enemy, the roaring lion that prowls around, is no match for the lion of Judah. But we got to, be, to not, not only know in our minds, but we got to believe in our hearts that it's true, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We got to believe it and not just know it. And finally, in the light of our Lord's return, Paul tells the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 15 to 17. He says, Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. If the musician and the worship team can come back right now, we will conclude in a moment's time. Paul reminds us that we should not live as unwise people, but really as wise people, making the most of every opportunity that we have because the days are evil. We don't want to spend our time, right, chasing pretty rainbows and pursuing dreams that don't really matter at the end of the day. 
there's nothing wrong with pursuing ambitions. But if God is not at the center of all our ambitions, it will all come to naught one day. And I always remember this very this um, saying, which is very familiar to all of us. There's only one life. This soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. I would just like all of us right now to close our eyes and for a moment just allow the Word of God that has been shared to just sink in. In a moment's time, we will be coming before the Lord's table. We'll be coming to the table of communion. And once again, I'd like to encourage all of us to just take a fresh glimpse at our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, He was the Lamb that was slain, but He will one day return as the Lion of Judah, the soon coming King and Judge. And as you gaze upon His majesty, His might, His power, and yet His gentleness, May your heart well up with adoration for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for you and I. time communion will be served but before we partake of communion we would also like to conclude with prayer around the altars because there might be some of you here who may be needing prayers for the particular situation that you are in and this evening there are just two groups of people that we would like to pray for you know as we come to the table of communion, we are reminded that our God is the Lamb that was slain and it is His blood that breaks every yoke, every fetter in our lives. And this evening, if you are struggling with a habit or an addiction, a behavioral pattern, angry emotions that is eating you up or an unhealthy mindset that you find very difficult to break. You can come to the table of communion with a sense of hope and knowing that the grace of God is available to you today. You can ask the Lamb of God to pay the price for your sins, to forgive you, to cleanse you, and to set you free from every bondage so that you can live for Him and glorify His name. And He is more than able to do it because He has won the victory for you on the cross of Calvary. He is extending His grace to you. And if you are in need of His grace today, come to Him just as you are and receive His grace at the table of communion. Second group of people, as we, are come, as we come to the table of communion, we are also reminded that our God is the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and He's fighting our battles. And this evening, if you are faced with an insurmountable challenge or pressing situation, know that God is more than able to make you an overcomer in every situation. If you will let Him, because the problem many times is that we want to have our own way and we try to dictate to God how we would like Him to work things out in our 
particular situation and we don't realize that the reason why we are not experiencing a breakthrough it is because we are continually struggling with him but the moment we let go and let him he will come to our aid and he will intervene in our situation he will do a better job than you and I he's the lion of Judah who has conquered his power is available to you today he's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all we can ask or imagine and his power is available to us to do the works of the ministry ministry can be very tough and draining at times sometimes we serve out of the barrenness of our spirit and defeat but today we are reminded that the power of the lion of judah who has conquered is available to us he has anointed us to be his witnesses and we can we can with the spiritual weapons that he has given to us we can triumph over the enemy of our soul and we can do great exploits for him so as we sing the song worthy is the lamb as we sing it one time and as we sing it a second time just feel free to come to the altar and just come before the lamb of god and the lion of judah the lord jesus christ who gave his life for you and i know that his grace and his power is available to you and you can encounter his grace and his power afresh today he's giving you the imitation are the lion of judah oh hallelujah 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 and because you are with us as we call upon you as we look to you oh lord jesus we do not have any fear oh whatever it is there that hinders us lord we know that this evening you will take away you will remove it out of our lives in the mighty name of our lord jesus christ hallelujah oh we thank you we thank you we thank you for that provision lord there is nothing nothing that is too hard for you that you can remove out of our lives no sin too great no act that cannot be cleansed by the blood of the lamb and lord jesus we pray that the fullness of your grace will just be poured out this evening upon our lives as we look to you. Whether we are standing here at the altar or standing where our seats are, Lord, we know it is not in any way by our works of righteousness, our abilities, our intelligence, what we are, but it is because of who you are and your grace is sufficient for us we thank you lord we thank you lord we thank you lord we thank you lord and we receive your touch even right now father especially for each one that has come to the altar and we pray father not just in faith believing but we receive lord we receive you Lord Jesus we receive you into our lives we receive you Lord into our situations and we thank you for your touch upon us we thank you Lord hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah